What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel and most importantly happy 2019 I swear it feels like I was just sitting in my bedroom last year saying happy 2018 to you guys I have no idea where any of this year is gone and I'm excited to see what 2019 brings for this channel for the cases we've already covered for the cases we're going to cover I'm just super excited a lot of fun things are happening this year it's just it's gonna be a great year and I'm very very excited and I hope we all have an amazing year together but I really really wanted to start this year off with a bang and I picked the right case for it let's just say that I don't know what to say about this case other than holy crap. Um, I've been working on this case for months now and I've been trying to find out information that it seems like nobody knows. I have been digging. I have been into depths of the internet that I never want to be in again. But buckle in guys because this is going to be an insane ride of a case. There's a lot of information. You might want to take notes. Let's go ahead and jump right into today's video. So today's case is about a three-year-old little boy named Jared Audadero and he went missing on October 2nd. 1999 from the Puta Canyon in Colorado. Jared was a very typical three-year-old little boy. I have one so I'm very familiar on their behavior. I know what this age is like and I think that's almost why I've been so wrapped up in this case. But Jared's family owned a resort in the canyon. They had just bought it pretty recently. It had a cabin, it had a little store, um, there were a few campsites, and they mainly rented the resort out to larger groups so people could have events or there could be retreats, getaways. And after buying the resort, they ended up deciding to move into it because in the back of the shop at the resort was like a little apartment type of situation. So it was Jared's parents and his sister, Jocelyn, that all lived in this apartment apartment at the resort. So Alan, his father, was a PE teacher at a high school and they kind of wanted to move out into this resort because obviously he's a very outdoorsy, active person and he really wanted to make sure his family was raised in the same way and this would offer an entirely different opportunity for them to live in an area like this. There's lots of hiking, trails, they could go fishing, do a lot of things outdoors and they really wanted to do it together as a family. But they had no idea what would end up happening not very long after they moved to this resort. So the weekend that Jared went missing, the family was busy winterizing the resort. And there was a Christian's single group that was based out of Denver. And they were actually set to come out that weekend to help Alan winterize the resort. Now I don't know much about this Christian singles group, but I know they used the resort a ton over the summer. They had a ton of their retreats there. Um, they had weekend getaways for the group and they were very familiar with the Audadero family and they were familiar enough to want to come and help him. So it was also an opportunity for them to come out to the resort to get kind of like their last weekend hoorah in before they waited until the next summer to return. So a group of these Christian singles were up at the resort that weekend and since they were so familiar with the Audadero family, no one was really surprised when Jocelyn, that was six years old at the time, asked Alan if he could go with a group of 11 of these Christian singles to the fish hatchery that was about a mile and a half down the road. There was a woman in the group, her name was Janet, and Jocelyn was really fond of Janet. They hung out a lot, they did a lot of things together. Now, Alan obviously didn't mind very much that Jocelyn wanted to go with them. I'm sure, obviously, he trusted this group of people. As siblings go, as soon as Jared heard that Jocelyn was going somewhere, like a fish hatchery by herself with this group, he desperately wanted to go as well. Now, this is something that Alan had an issue with. Not necessarily because he didn't trust this group of people, but because three-year-olds are difficult, they take a lot of work, you have to watch them constantly, I will set my son down and in two seconds if I'm not paying attention, he is gone, he has destroyed something. So I would have the same feeling. I would be very, very hesitant to let my son go anywhere and Alan was feeling the exact same way. But after a while of Jared being really upset and saying, you know, Dad, I can go, I can go, please let me go, I want to be with Jocelyn, I want to have fun, Alan decided, you know what, it's perfectly fine, it's only a mile and a half down the road, what could possibly happen? And on top of that, the group didn't mind at all taking Jared. They promised Alan they would keep a good eye on him, so... 
That's that, and Jared was allowed to go. So Jared, Jocelyn, and 11 adults from the group headed out to the fish hatchery, and I think it was probably around nine that morning. I don't know an exact time. I know it was definitely earlier than 10. And while they did originally go to the fish hatchery, it seemed to not be as exciting as they assumed it was going to be, and they really wanted to find something else that was a little bit more fun to do. So they packed Jocelyn and Jared back in the car and decided to head out and find a quick trail to take a hike on. They drove about 16 miles away and ended up finding a trail called the Big South Trail, which is technically all pretty much from what I've seen off the exact same road that the resort was off of. Now they saw this trail and figured it would be an awesome quick trail to hop onto. The parking was literally right off of the main road. The entrance was right there. It seemed very quick, very easy. So they parked and they decided to go ahead and head in. But the one thing they didn't do was tell Alan that they had a change in plans. While they decided to go to the fish hatchery and then changed plans and headed to the Big South Trail in the Colorado mountains, Alan was busy hard at work winterizing the resort and he kind of wasn't paying much attention to the time. He trusted these people enough with his kids. He wasn't really worried about it. He figured when they were done, they would come back. They were probably having a good time anyways. But that was until a few hours later. Alan was in the apartment in the back of the shop when two of the women and the manager of the resort, I think his name was Butch, burst in through the door without knocking and they all looked pretty flustered. The two women told Alan that something had happened to Jared, which obviously confused and upset him. And at this point, Alan is thinking through all the things, you know, like did he accidentally choke on something? Did he fall and hurt himself? Did he break a leg? Did he break an arm? You know, uh, is he scared because he's with people that aren't his parents? Um, just all these different things. And when all these guesses kind of continued to fall short, they still didn't tell him what exactly was going on. And what they said was very strange. Um, it's definitely something that I find odd. Alan has said it's something he still to this day doesn't quite understand. What they told him was that Jared is okay, we just can't find him. Now, I listened to a ton of different interviews with Alan and every time he brings this up, he says the first thing he thought was, if you can't find Jared, how do you know he's okay? But when you're a parent and you're kind of in this mindset, you don't ever want to believe anything is wrong. And because he didn't know any of the details of what really had gone on, he kind of believed them and he assumed they knew what they were talking about. Jared must be okay, they said he was. And it ended up directly affecting how he initially reacted to the entire situation. So at this point, Alan is still thinking Jared and Jocelyn and the rest of the group were at the fish hatchery. After all, that was the only plan he was told. This is when he realized that his son was not lost in a fish hatchery. His son was lost on the Big South Trail, a seven mile long trail going straight through the wilderness, through cliffs and canyons with wild animals, incredibly dense forests. And this was every parent's worst nightmare. The manager of the resort ended up asking Alan if he wanted him to call search and rescue to go up to this area and help him search. But Alan was still kind of in this mindset that, you know, he can't be that far off of the trail. Like they said, he's fine, we just can't find him. So Alan's really thinking, you know, he's playing hide and seek, he's playing a game, he doesn't understand how serious it is. And he honestly believed all he had to do was go out there and call out to Jared and Jared would come out of his hiding place, he would come run and say hi to everybody, you know, like, I tricked you, ha ha ha. He told Butch to not go that far, that it wouldn't be necessary. Now, Alan arrived at the Big South Trail. As I said, I think it's between 16 and 20 miles away from the resort, so it probably took a decent amount of time to get there. And he instantly got onto the trail and ran for a straight mile. And he was just yelling Jared's name over and over again because again in his head, he swore that was going to make Jared pop out of the woods and everything would be fine. But after this mile to mile and a half, he received absolutely no response at all from Jared. And that's when he realized that the situation was much more serious than he had originally thought it was. In absolute panic, he turned around and he tried to run back to the parking lot as fast as he possibly could because he wanted to call search and rescue at this point. He had just told Butch 
Butch, no, don't do it. But now he was really kicking himself for not telling Butch to just do it because he didn't have any idea the extent of the seriousness of this situation. And as soon as he got down to the parking lot, he was overjoyed to see that Butch hadn't listened to him anyways and had called search and rescue. In this area, the cell reception was horrific and Alan would have had to go to the nearest resort, if not all the way to his own resort, to hopefully call search and rescue, which would have delayed searching for potentially hours. And that is such a critical time period and that is time that you cannot waste. So at this point, Alan can't find his son. Search and rescue and police are there. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And now he's just wondering, you know, where on earth is Jocelyn? Because from what he had been told from all of the people that he, you know, had seen from the group, everyone had stayed there. No one left. Every single person, including Jocelyn, was on this trail. And this is kind of where more confusing information starts to go in. So he was kind of surprised when Jocelyn ended up pulling in with Janet into the parking lot. And according to Janet, I guess she had taken Jocelyn back to the resort to see if someone had taken Jared back there. So now that he knew that Jocelyn was safe, he really wanted to figure out what on earth happened. What what happened to Jared? How did Jared get lost? Why was no one really watching Jared out of 11 adults that promised Alan they would? Um, it was just a lot. He didn't understand a lot. No one would tell him anything. Even when they came to the resort, it was like everyone was just beating around the bush and it was really, really odd to him. So according to the group, apparently at around 10 a.m. that morning, they got onto the trail. When they got onto the trail at around 10 a.m., they ended up splitting up into two different groups. They had the slow group and they had the fast group. And obviously the children were in the slow group, which includes Jared. Now, according to the group and pretty much every article you will ever read, Jared wanted to move from the slow group to the fast group. Nothing ever says if anyone from the group accompanied him from one group to another. I haven't even seen how far apart these groups were, like if the slow group could see the fast group. But either way, according to them, he decided he wanted to run up to the fast group, and when he got there, he kept on with his pace. So he ended up passing the fast group. Now, when he walked up ahead of them, the members of the group said they even were having a conversation about how someone needed to keep an eye on him but apparently nobody did because this was the very last time that any of them saw Jared. But apparently, Jared wasn't walking alone. He never walked from the slow group to the fast group alone, and he wasn't even walking ahead of the fast group alone. Jared was with a couple of fishermen, and Alan and his family didn't even find this out through authorities. They found it out through the radio one day in the car. So when this first initial search was happening, when all these stories were being told, not a single person mentioned these fishermen. And it seems like in the media and in the different things that I've looked at, a lot is put into the fact that the authorities didn't mention that, but I can't help but be more concerned about the fact that not a single person in that group mentioned the fact that Jared had been with two complete strangers when he went missing. You would think if you lost track of a young child and the family is looking for that child, that would be one of the very first things that you brought up, but they didn't bring it up, authorities didn't bring it up, and the family had to find out over the freaking radio, which I think is insane. So according to these two fishermen, they had started on the trail just after the group. So they were not far behind them. And they ended up passing the slow group first. And this is kind of the same time where Jared decided to go from the slow group to the fast group, likely because he saw these new people and apparently he was being really talkative. He wanted to know about them. He was asking them all sorts of questions. So he walked from the slow group to the fast group with these two fishermen. Now again, because he was very fascinated with these fishermen, he also passed the fast group with them as well. So after a while of continuing on with the fishermen, with his group behind him, they ended up splitting up. So at about one and a half miles into the trail, they were at campsite two. And there was a fork in the road and the fishermen needed to go one way to get to the river to fish and Jared split off to go the other way. Now, I have listened to quite a few podcasts and looked up a lot of information and the fishermen had a lot of people come down on them about why on earth they let a three-year-old just continue walking on their own. Um, I had the exact same first thought as well. I could never imagine leaving a three-year-old by themselves in the middle of the woods, unsure of where their group was. I have seen a lot of people claim, you know, some 
somehow these people did know the group was behind them, but I wanted answers. And the Generation Y podcast I was listening to, I mean, also was like, you know, how does someone assume that? Or did they hear them? Did they see them? And even Alan wasn't able to answer that question. So I took a pretty deep dive and searched heavily and I was actually able to read something straight from the Colorado search and rescue board that was put out I mean right after all this happened. I was able to confirm the hikers did physically see the group only 50 to 80 feet behind Jared. At around 11:30 a.m. they said that's when they split up and the only reason they left they said they watched Jared running up the trail is because directly behind him not even that far away was the group. So at this point, the story was just confusing and nobody seemed to really know exactly what was going on. Um, you know, the family seemed to be getting bits and pieces of the story from the group. At least that is what I am taking from all the information that's been said. Um, and nobody was really watching Jared, a three-year-old, as closely as they needed to be. So now back to the search. Now that they kind of knew kind of what exactly was going on. Search and rescue teams started to pour in and the sheriff's department started sending people into the woods and they started searching along the entire seven mile trail. Now they figured this would be a pretty easy search and rescue because of the terrain. The forest was incredibly dense along the sides of the trail. So the trail was pretty much the only clear areas you were really going to go by. A three-year-old likely wouldn't be able to make it far. There were a lot of drop-offs. There were a lot of high cliffs. Um, you know, it just wasn't very likely. Jared was very far off the trail at all. So they figured he was hiding somewhere. Um, you know, maybe he had just lost his way. They would definitely find him. But after hours and hours of searching and calling out for his name, and I mean searching campsites, searching all down the trail, they weren't able to find him at all. There was absolutely no sign of Jared anywhere. So that's when they wondered if maybe he had just exhausted himself so much. After all, he's only a three-year-old little boy. He had been hiking already for at least one and a half miles that they knew of. He might have been asleep somewhere. So then they started going back, going through all their steps again and searching into all these different areas where possibly Jared could be sleeping. But again, absolutely nothing. So they decided to go out the next morning when Jared normally would wake up in the morning because at that point he would likely be again full of energy and searching for a way to get out. So they went back, they searched and they searched, they called out for him and nothing. And authorities kept expanding their search and expanding their search further off the trails into areas that didn't really make sense because there's no way Jared could have gotten there, but still nothing. They brought in dive teams to search all the water in the area. They brought in cadaver dogs. I did see that cadaver dogs did originally hit between camps four and five. They definitely picked up his trail and then it kind of went away. Um, but I'm gonna get deeper into that later in the video. Now, originally, the searches were great. There were a lot of people out there looking. Things were going very well. Authorities seemed to really be doing their job, but it wasn't long before a lot of tension started mounting between the family and authorities. So authorities had set up a command center at the family's resort. It was kind of acting as their little base station. There wasn't a lot out there again, and it wasn't that far from where Jared went missing. And they really took over the entire investigation, which is expected. It's the authorities, it was the sheriff department. Who else is going to do that? However, they started making it very difficult for anybody who wanted to help. They completely blocked off the trail and they refused to even let Jared's family on the trail to help with the searches. Now, Alan's family flew in from California because they wanted to be able to help with this search. I mean, this is a little boy. This is their loved one that is missing. And one day they decided to go out to the trail. They wanted to go help authorities search, do whatever they possibly could. And Alan stayed back at the resort, also known as the command center. Now, because it was also the command center, there were sheriffs and people staying at the resort. There were a lot of walkie talkies and things going on, phones set up. And one of the sheriffs there at the time had their walkie talkie go off pretty shortly after Alan's family left to go and search. And 
On the other end, it said, we're going to have to arrest the Otadero family if they don't stop causing problems. Now, this confused and scared Alan because he had no idea what on earth his family went down there and did. They had to have done something crazy to really, really upset authorities enough to threaten to arrest them. So he immediately hopped in the car and drove down there to try to sort out and calm down the situation. But when he got there, he figured out that the only reason authorities were threatening to arrest the family was because they came up and asked to help search. Now apparently it took all day arguing back and forth for someone to finally agree that they could go and search on the trail, but they had to have a police escort the entire time, which Alan thought was very odd, but at this point they were just really thankful they could go out and do something, so they didn't care. Now they weren't allowed out on the trail for very long, and when they finally turned around to come back, the officer that was with them stopped them and said, you know, I just want to let you guys know that you're really, really causing a ton of problems for us and you can't do that anymore. And this sets the tone for the rest of how authorities treated the Otadero family. It got to the point where Alan and his family had to start threatening the police department to understand any of what was going on, to be allowed to ask questions, to be allowed to go to the trail, to be allowed to search anything. They would go to the authorities and say, if you don't let us help look for our loved one, we're gonna go down to the media that's swarming in the parking lot and we're going to tell them that you're not cooperating with this young boy's family. Now, I personally understand the importance of preserving a crime scene or something along those lines. However, if a handful of family members are trying to go out and look for someone that is considered lost, um, a lost child, a missing and endangered child, why would they take it as far as immediately threatening to arrest them the first time they ask to help? It just seems a little bit extreme to me that that was their response. Searches continued and the family and authorities continued to butt heads. There was never really a time where they got along well after this. The Otadero family just felt like they were really being shoved out of this investigation. They weren't being told anything. There was a massive lack in communication and respect. And eventually, during all that madness, a helicopter was sent in to search for Jared from above because they had done really all they could do on the trails and all the places they could physically get to they tried to go to from what I know so they really needed the aid of something different now unfortunately this helicopter searching for Jared ended up crashing now nobody died at all however this is just a prime example of what this entire case was like it just seemed to be one disaster after another after another and it was terrifying for the family because when this helicopter went up to search for Jared, not long after, Jared's father, Alan, started getting phone call after phone call after phone call of people saying, hey, did they find Jared up on the mountain? And when Alan would ask why everyone thought this, people would say, well, you know, we saw the helicopter, we saw it head up to the mountain, and then right after, ambulances flew by. So. You can imagine how Jared's family was feeling. They're like, wait a minute, a helicopter searching for Jared and then ambulances. That means they found him. So they sat and they waited by the phone because they were in what was supposed to be the command center. They waited and they waited for a phone call and they didn't get one. So Alan stayed back to continue waiting for the phone call and he sent his wife and Jocelyn to another resort to see if they maybe heard any news. And according to that resort, that's when they found out the helicopter had crashed. So this other resort knew more information about what had happened than the family of the missing person the helicopter was searching for and what was supposed to be the command center. So now, while they did know more, they did know that the ambulances were likely from the helicopter crashing. They didn't know if the helicopter had found Jared and then it crashed. Was it just the people that were on the plane, the actual searchers? It's just like I was saying, it was a total lack of communication and I cannot imagine how it must have felt sitting and waiting for answers, assuming 
you would be the first people that someone would really think of and not getting anything. And then knowing that everyone else seemed to know 10 times more than you did as the family. But the helicopter crash wasn't the only wild thing that happened in this case because as I said, this is a case that knocked me on my feet and I couldn't even get back up before finding the next crazy bit of information. While the search for Jared was going on, a man in the military was in the area and he was a trained tracker. Now, not just a typical trained tracker, this man was going to be sent to Afghanistan to track bombs. Like he had been specially trained by the military to track everything. He was incredibly skilled. And because he was in the area, I think he kind of took it upon himself to try to track Jared. Because after all, if you have a skill like that, why not use it? And the whole chain of events that happens after this is just so insane to me. So this man came into the resort because there was food there, it was the closest thing to this trail, the closest place to stay, and he ended up bringing up his food to check out. And he started talking to the cashier about, you know, I'm so tired, I have been nonstop searching for this young boy on this mountain. I mean, I've climbed up and I've climbed down and I'm just so exhausted. And he had absolutely no idea that this person he was talking to was Alan, Jared's father. So when Alan introduced himself, this man just went pale and he said, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you right now. This is so important. Please go sit down. You have to sit down. I have to show you something. The man started to draw a map and on the map he put an X. And he said that he had been out tracking Jared and he had tracked Jared to a very specific point over and over and over again. So the giant X on the spot was where he believed Jared was, but he couldn't quite reach this area. And he had tried to ask for the help of others to search. He tried going to authorities, everyone possible, and he couldn't get anyone to help him. So who better to ask than Alan? Because if Alan went to authorities and said, look, this professionally trained military man that can track bombs, tracked my child to this location, please at least check there, you would assume authorities would do it. So he called authorities, gave them this information, and he actually thought he had a major breakthrough because the authorities usually immediately were like, no, that's ridiculous, we're not doing it. But at this point, the authorities said, you know what, we'll think about it, we will you know, see what we can throw together, and we'll call you tomorrow. So Alan really believed someone would go out to this area and check. But he was nothing but disappointed, no surprise, the next day when authorities called him. So apparently authorities said, you know, we're actually not going to check this area because the helicopter already flew over that place and they didn't find anything. So technically it's already been searched and we see no reason to go search it again. Now, this comes into play massively later in this video. So do not forget about this map. At all. So authorities were really sticking to brand in this case by dismissing absolutely everything anyone brought to them and it wasn't the only time that they had done it. So the night that it was announced that Jared was missing, a ranger came forward and said that he had actually seen someone he believed to be Jared on a trail earlier that day. Now the ranger had been taking a group of people on a tour and saw who he thought was Jared on the trail with a older man. Now, Jared, according to this ranger, kept yanking away from this man and running straight towards the ranger. And Jared, I think, kept calling the man Gerald, according to the ranger. I think it's very possible he was just saying his name and the ranger was mishearing it. Um, but either way, the ranger really brushed it off, assumed it was just a three-year-old, you know, having a moment, kept sending him back to this man, and after all, according to him, the man didn't look suspicious. He didn't look upset or flustered or anything, so he didn't think twice about it until he saw Jared's face on the news that night. Now, authorities did attempt to find this man, but the one thing they didn't do was ever question the ranger. And as if that's not already bad enough, they then went on to lie about it on public television. <laughs> they kept saying, you know, we've, we've questioned this man, we've talked to the ranger, we've interviewed him, we know who we're looking for, we know this, we know that. But the ranger has come forward multiple times and said, he has never contacted me. And according to Alan, 
To this day, the ranger has still never ever been contacted and questioned about what exactly he saw. So someone locally started looking into this and started looking into the idea that a man potentially snatched Jared and he decided to dive deep into it. I don't know if it was just a journalist looking into this or if they were trying to create some short film or something, but this person went to question Alan about this theory and also wanted to question the sheriff about it. Now, apparently, a learning channel was also filming with the sheriff on the day that this person was set to do the interview, set to question the sheriff. And when the sheriff thought that the interview was over and, you know, the interviewer, I think, you know, stepped away and left, the sheriff thought all the cameras were off, but, um, surprise, they weren't. And what they caught him saying is disgusting. So apparently as soon as the interview ended, the sheriff got up and said, are you as tired of this story as I am? And chuckled as if it was some sort of joke. This was only three weeks after Jared went missing. Now this footage was leaked. I don't know if they put it in the documentary or the learning channel, or I don't know if someone just released it to the internet. I have no idea, but either way, everybody saw the sheriff say, that horrific comment and man it came back to bite him people were infuriated all over the county people from the county were calling the sheriff's department i mean phones ringing off of the hooks they were pissed people from the actual sheriff's department itself were threatening to quit because they were so embarrassed and said that that's not what they signed up to be a part of you know that's never how they would view a case um, it was just a disaster. To hear the people that are supposed to be on your side and helping you find your son say that they're tired of hearing about it, they're tired of hearing about the story, they're tired of listening to theories, like they've been listening to it for years and it's only been three weeks. The family was basically done. They were so disappointed and heartbroken and they felt stuck and they felt like the authorities just didn't care, that they didn't want to help to their full ability. They didn't even want to think about it or talk about it or hear about it. And you know guys, it just gets worse. And this is what I was warning you about before, it just gets worse. Just when you think it can't be any more unbelievable, so multiple cadaver dog teams, multiple search and rescue teams, the National Guard, I mean organization after organization after organization called Allen and said, hey, this situation you're in is horrific. You're all over the national news. Everyone knows about Jared being missing. We want to help you. We want to be of any assistance we possibly can be. But if you're not familiar with the way things work, sheriffs have to invite these organizations in. So, I mean, sometimes they'll reach out and say, you know, if you want to help search, come here. But for organizations like that, usually sheriffs have to give an approval, they have to give a case number, they have to give, you know, a couple of different things, and um, then the organization can kind of set things in motion on their end. When Alan went to the sheriff's department and said, you know, these people want to help, like the National Guard called me personally and wants to help, the sheriff's department turned away every single organization. They said, you know, absolutely not. I'm sorry, Alan, we can't afford to pay these people. So Alan didn't know much and was, you know, just distraught, but I guess understanding, as understanding as he could be. And then he had to call all these people back and say, you know, I'm sorry, but they can't afford to pay you. And when it came to the National Guard in specific, but it's not the only one, the National Guard told him, pay us? <laughs> what do you mean? Like the Sheriff's Department knows that when it's a situation like this, we send in volunteers. We don't ask for money to help people. We don't ask, you know, for money to help search for a young little boy. And the Sheriff's Department knew that. The Sheriff's Department knew that every single one of these organizations wouldn't, they wouldn't have had to pay them a penny at all. And they still told them no and then lied to Alan about why. And unfortunately, it wasn't even like their own searches were necessarily even effective because they had been searching for Jared this entire time with a pair of Alan's shorts. 
Apparently, law enforcement was sent to the resort to go through the room and gather something of Jared's pretty much right away. Um, I don't think with the assistance of the family. And they grabbed a pair of Alan's shorts, a pair of adult shorts, and a pair of three-year-old shorts look drastically different. And they had been using that forever and not a single person had thought, hey, this doesn't look like it belongs to a three-year-old. And I think the only reason they found out is because they just so happened to bring it out when Alan was there. And they pulled it out and Alan was just in shock and taken back because he said, wait a minute, you're meaning to tell me that you've been using a pair of my shorts this entire time to find my son? It's just unbelievable, you guys. But then again, finally, Alan thought, you know, maybe authorities are finally warming up to something. Maybe they're realizing they need this extra help because the Arapaho search and rescue team, an, a search and rescue team that's specific to the area, they know the terrain, they know everything, they came forward and wanted to volunteer their efforts. Now, everything was lined up. Authorities, for some reason, agreed to this. I'm assuming because they were local. Um, and, I mean, paperwork was done, times, dates, everything was set up. And then the night before, the Arapaho search and rescue team got a phone call from the sheriff's department with no explanation. The only thing the sheriff's department said to them was, if you show up tomorrow morning to search, you will all be arrested. So here we go again with them threatening to arrest people for wanting to search for this little boy. Something that they had agreed with and they had helped set up. They were gonna arrest them if they showed up that morning. These people did end up showing up. They said, you know what, forget this. We're not going to be told no. So the next morning they came, but they came in their civilian clothes. They didn't wear their regular search and rescue t-shirts, any of their gear. They just came as average civilians to look. And that's how they still got in to search for Jared. And on one of these searches, I'm not sure if it was this exact same search or a different search that was put together, but a US congressman was in the party and the search party and he showed up that day and Alan was there, Alan's brother was there, other people of the family were there and in the middle of the search this US congressman approaches Alan. He said to Alan, you know, I don't know what's going on but I received a call at my office, at his work office as a US congressman from authorities saying that if he knew what was good for him he would not show up to search that day. <sighs> you guys. What? What? How many people is that now that this law enforcement agency threatened to arrest and just threatened in general if they tried to become a part of this search? I just don't understand how there could ever be anything positive underlying that. At this point, the Otadero family had really come to their own conclusion on why authorities were acting this way and treating everyone this way. They honestly believed that the authorities thought they were going to quickly locate Jared, it was going to be a quick and easy situation, and they really wanted the credit for it. And that's why they didn't allow anybody in. That's why they made sure they were the only ones in there that could possibly take credit for finding Jared. They wanted to be all over the national news. They wanted to be the heroes. So once they didn't find him right away, they realized that if they brought anyone else in, any other search team that knew what they were doing, any other person from a legal standpoint, that these people would see their missteps instantly and they wanted to save face. They did not want to have to admit that they messed up. They didn't want to have to admit the things they had done wrong. Now granted, that's not anything we know. That's not anything I can prove, but that's just what the Otadero family concluded. After everything that had happened, after I'm sure things happened that we don't even know about, they strongly believed that the Sheriff's Department was terrified of anyone finding out all the things they should have done and didn't. Now, despite the lack of information or welcomed help, authorities still came to plenty of different conclusions on what they believed happened to Jared. Now, this ranged from things like a mountain lion attack, which I think ties into the whole, he was asking if he saw a bear thing, um, to eventually, Alan was actually told that Jared more than likely fell into one of the rivers. Now, there's, I think, two or 
two or three different rivers running in the area. Um, I don't think it's anything too deep. I think it's just little creeks and then there's a few different larger body of bodies of water that they run into. Um, but authorities told Alan specifically they believed he fell in this water. They believed he ended up in one of these smaller lakes. Um, and because it was so cold all the time in this area, he likely wouldn't surface for about four years, which is an interesting time frame given the next bit of information that I'm about to tell you. Very interesting and very specific. So four years after Jared went missing, on Wednesday, June 4th, 2003, something huge was found and it would throw a lot more questions into the mix. Hikers were climbing about 500 plus vertical feet above the Big South Trail. So I'm like bottom to top, straight up, 500 vertical feet straight up. That's how high they were. Um, and it was about, I think, two miles past the head of the trail, so about half a mile past the last time Jared was seen, and they ended up finding scattered clothing. And they weren't on the trail, obviously. They had gone off the trail, they were up on this gigantic cliff, and they immediately knew something was very wrong. It was kids' clothing. Everyone, I think, would kind of assume something's not right here, so they called authorities. When authorities showed up, these clothes were positively identified as being the clothing that Jared was wearing on the day that he disappeared. It was a pair of blue and red, kind of like sweatpants, um, and a sweatshirt, and a pair of sneakers. Now everything about this was kind of odd from the get-go because Jared was three and there's absolutely no way pretty much that he could have climbed a 500 vertical foot cliff basically by himself. Alan ended up going to the specific location and in order for him to get to this area, he had to have help from two members of a search and rescue team. I'm pretty sure they had to have some sort of equipment to get up there. I know Alan also went back later on with his family and they tried to get up there and they had to turn around because they just couldn't do it. So that was odd. Uh, and then on top of that, apparently the pants were inside out. Now, this is kind of a big thing to a lot of people. Personally, I am not surprised by it, only because I again have a three-year-old. Granted, I don't know what crazy method Jared used to take his clothes off, but I know my son's methods. And normally when my son takes his pants off, he kind of like pulls his pants down and then pulls his legs up and out, which in turn flips the pants inside out. Um, so a lot of people find that is odd. To me, I know from my own experience that that's how my son personally does it. Um, I'm sure a lot of kids don't think to pull from their ankle first, which would make them right side out. Um, but a lot of people think that's incredibly strange. The clothes also didn't look like they had been worn down really at all or had even sat in the elements for four years because the theories are that he was attacked by a mountain lion. There wasn't blood all over these clothes. There were no holes in these clothes as if an animal had punctured through them. Uh, it didn't look like there were any drag marks. It, there were any rough patches that they saw on the knees or you know really frayed bits where it would have shown Jared was kind of climbing up on his hands and knees to get up this, which you would assume if he went up there by himself. On the pants, there was a leg that was missing, but it was obvious that it had been pulled like the string had been pulled out and unraveled perfectly like animals had used it for their nest so that wasn't necessarily a sign of anything um, and the shoes themselves were probably the craziest things to me because those shoelaces are white <laughs> and I know that sounds crazy but with the way that it snows and melts and the weather that I'm sure there is in the mountains in Colorado and mud and things sliding down I don't understand how those shoes stayed so clean. And that is probably the biggest thing in everything, is everything looks clean. The shoes, according to his dad, look just like the last time he saw them. There's no weathering, there's no increased amount of dirt. It just doesn't make sense that they stayed that nice after being out in the elements for four years. But the other biggest thing is no blood. 
None at all. No drops of blood. All of it was DNA tested even later on. Nothing. No blood over anything. So the whole idea that there was a mountain lion attack now simply just doesn't make a lot of sense. Obviously this swirled all throughout the media because this was a very widely publicized case and especially because all the attention had really been put on the sheriff after his atrocious comment shortly after Jared went missing. And what was interesting though is that I think one news channel or someone that covered the case mentioned that if the clothes were up there, they were surprised there wasn't a bone. They just had a hard time believing a lot of information they were being told and they were questioning things and they said, you know, we would expect to see a bone or a tooth or something left behind of Jared. A week after the clothing was found, directly after someone really questioned the fact that nothing else of Jared was found, no remains, no anything, part of a cranium, and get this, also a tooth, basically the two things that someone had mentioned being concerned about them not finding were found in pretty much the exact same area. Somehow, after being missed and all the other pretty extensive searches authorities said they did after finding the clothing. Now I can see that at first, you know, they're looking for clothes, there's no telling if the bones or the tooth got buried underneath dirt. Again, there's a lot of snow, things melt, things run down, things get covered up. But the issue I have is that the tooth was actually just sitting perfectly on top of a pile of pine needles. And from the picture, it appears like there is the ground, there is a fallen over tree, and then there's the pine needles, and then there's the tooth, as if it had just been placed there. So again, after four years of melting snow, of rain, of, you know, probably minor bits of flooding, this tooth was just perfectly sitting clean and on top of these pine needles. Now, as if all this doesn't already seem a bit convenient and questionable and interesting, uh, to top it off, this is where the map comes back in. All of these items were found within 35 feet of where the X had been placed. 35 feet. Now the piece of skull and the tooth were sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigations for a forensic examination and they wanted to do a DNA confirmation to see if it belonged to Jared. Now the results came back and it confirmed that there was about an 86% chance that the cranium did in fact belong to Jared as well as the tooth. But because of the kind of questionable and sketchy and shady business so far with the sheriff's department, Alan really wanted to send it off to another doctor in Ohio to relook over all of these results to confirm them. And this is where more shady information comes in. Surprise. According to this doctor in Ohio that was looking over the results, he said that the DNA results were actually pretty inconclusive and the tooth apparently had more than one person's DNA on it, meaning that the tooth was contaminated when it was tested. Meaning either someone had handled it and placed the tooth there, which is one giant theory, or the people who gathered it as evidence did not take the proper precautions and they messed with the tooth or the people testing the tooth messed with the tooth. Either way, something was very wrong here. And it was very frustrating because obviously that would make you want to test this tooth again, but the tooth had been completely destroyed in the original testing. So there wasn't even anything left to look into. Now, two years later, it was able to be confirmed that this cranium did in fact belong to Jared. So Jared at this point is deceased and this cranium did belong to him. However, nobody was really speaking about the contaminated tooth and how it was conveniently destroyed fully. Plus when Alan was originally informed about the results from the original first DNA testing of the tooth, not a single person mentioned that there was another set of DNA. But this is again just the start of the questions here. To go back to the authorities claiming that Jared likely fell in a body of water and would rise to the surface in four years, and then partial remains were found pretty much four years later. A woman in the medical field ended up getting in contact with Alan and she said that she knew exactly where the scratches that were on the top of the cranium came from. Now she was emailing back and forth with Alan. That was the only form of communication. 
and she said that the only way the cranium would have received the scratches that it had in it was if it had been drug along the bottom of a creek bed, which supported the authorities' theory that Jared had fallen into some sort of body of water and would rise up four years later. However, Alan really questioned this because he said, you know, if Jared had been in the water, how on earth did his clothes and partial remains of his end up in the exact same place where someone had already tracked him years before? Now she replied and said, oh, well, the obvious answer here is that there was clearly a flash flood and it just brought everything up and then dumped it. Well, Alan questioned this as well and said, what kind of flash flood do you know raises up 500 vertical feet without it being an actual catastrophe, like a natural disaster? Well, after Alan questioned all of this, this person stopped responding to him. Maybe I'm crazy because I have not seen anyone else really connect any of those things together before, but I'm seeing a lot of odd connecting coincidences and it seems to me that there is a very specific narrative that's really, really being pushed here. So that in itself was odd, but Alan still had even more questions when it came to the items that were found with the remains, the clothes, the cranium, the tooth. Apparently strange hairs were found in the collar of Jared's sweatshirt, and they were also sent off like everything else for a forensic examination. Now, results came back. There was not a single drop of blood on any of the clothes anywhere. Um, and Alan was able to see all of the different tests for this. He was able to look at all of the results. He was able to take these things and confirm them with other doctors. However, this set of results, for some reason, nobody would give to Alan. The only thing that the sheriff would tell Alan about these results was that it was non-human and it didn't belong to a mountain lion. That's it. So that tells me it wasn't inconclusive because if it was inconclusive, the sheriff would never be able to say if it was a mountain lion or not. They would never be able to rule out that it was a human. So why didn't they just give Alan the results like every single other test, every single other file, every police report Alan has, except for this one saying what these hairs were. When you are willing to release every single file in a case except for that one, Ugh, there's something going on there. There is no denying that. I feel like there's no beating around the bush when it comes to that. So the police report, again, theorized that Jared was more than likely attacked by a mountain lion, and it said kind of the circumstances around it. So their assumption was that Jared was running ahead of the entire group, and he was snatched up while no one was paying attention. And it then goes on to say that likely the mountain lion ended up dragging Jared up the steep cliff when it heard the other hikers. Now, this makes a lot of sense because despite a lot of information that you would assume, mountain lions tend to avoid people. Um, we kind of are seen as a threat to them. Obviously, smaller children look like a meal half the time. Um, it's something they can handle. But for the most part, mountain lions aren't known for going out of their way to attack people. So if they hurt someone, they're more than likely to run off than not. I'm pretty sure you're more likely to be bit and attacked by a dog than you are by a mountain lion. But the entire report is very contradicting when it comes to their explanation of a lot of the factual information they had in the case. So the report goes on to say that one of the reasons why Jared might not have had any blood on any of his clothing is because he took his clothing off before he was attacked. Now that leads to a lot of questions like why on earth would this little boy have stripped down out of his clothes on the middle of a trail? when it was October and cold outside. Granted, honestly, you can't put a lot past kids. They do very strange things at very unexplainable times. 
um, but it takes a while for a kid to get their clothes off, okay? I don't know if you've ever watched a three-year-old try to get their clothes off. It takes a decent amount of time sometimes, and because the group was thought to have only been about 50 to 80 feet behind him, and the time it would have taken for him to get his clothes off, I am sure they would have caught up to him or maybe at least seen him at that point. Um, and then also, if he had taken his clothes off first and then was attacked, why weren't his clothes on the trail? So that leads to, okay, he took his clothes off, but he had to get up that 500 vertical foot embankment first, and then he took his clothes off. So then you question, well, if he did that, let's say that happened, why didn't his clothes show any signs of him struggling to get up this cliff? Jared never had his shoes tied. He did not like having his shoes tied. His shoes weren't scuffed. Both shoes made it up to the top. If he had climbed up all these rocks like they are claiming he could have, his shoes either A, would have fallen off because they weren't tied, or B, would have scuff marks all over them. Neither one of those things happened. The next question is, if Jared went up to the top of this cliff, took his clothes off, that means that in that exact same moment, he was also conveniently attacked by a mountain lion, which is how his remains were also in the same place that his clothes were. And I would assume from that, his partial remains would be laying on the top of that cliff and when they did the helicopter ride over that area that the authorities claimed they searched, they likely would have seen something down there. Um, but they didn't see anything. So let's say Jared was attacked by a mountain lion and his clothes were still on. Mountain lions are sneaky. You cannot rule out that the group was only 50 to 80 feet behind him and didn't hear a mountain lion attack potentially. They are predators. They know how to sneak up on their prey. They know how to take the prey without causing a huge commotion. There are reports that someone heard Jared scream. Um, a lot of people said it just sounded like he was laughing. A lot of people say that never actually happened. I can't confirm either way. But either way, a lot of the times when mountain lions attack kids, they grab them by the top of their head. Normally they would go for the stomach, but with smaller prey, it's just easier for the top of the head. And now a lot of people are saying, oh, well, that's easy. That explains why there's no blood on any of the clothes. I have looked so deeply into mountain lion attacks since. There have been professionals who you know, know so much about mountain lions and mountain lion attacks, they have come forward and said there's no way there wouldn't have been blood. When I looked at my Google research, which may not say a lot, but I spent a lot of time looking, I've seen even the smallest attacks. I'm talking a child was snatched before the mountain lion could even go anywhere. A parent scared it away. Even in those tiny attacks, there's still a ton of blood. There's still puncture wounds. They're grabbing you to grab you. They're not grabbing you to delicately move you. I mean, they are grabbing you. He would have had puncture wounds in his skin, on his head. There would have been puncture wounds, which means there would have been blood. Now, that blood likely would have been dripping down his head, which would mean I would expect to see blood at least around the collar. Now, let's say that didn't happen. It wasn't enough for it to get down there. Blood was at least dripping on the ground, and if he was being dragged up this cliff by a mountain lion like everyone is claiming, he likely was being dragged through his own trail of blood, which again, I would expect there to be blood on his clothes. None of these theories just honestly make any sense. I have no idea what to think. When it comes to how quickly he disappeared, I lean towards it has to be a mountain lion attack. The only thing that could snatch him up and take him that far away to where he couldn't be found in the area so fast has to be a mountain lion. And then you think back to all of the shady and sketchy information and withheld information and non-matching stories. I mean, from the group that was supposedly watching over Jared to the authorities, it just, it doesn't make any sense. It's like there's not a clear answer at the end of this tunnel. And the family knows at this point, Jared's no longer living but they don't know what on earth happened to him. And it's like, you can't have closure until you know, until you can understand. And I feel like, unfortunately, this is a case where a bunch of people are simply trying to cover their butts 
at the cost of anyone ever finding out what really happened to Jared. Nobody thinks that those clothes were out in the elements for four years, meaning that a lot of the theorists out there believe that the clothes were placed after the fact. There is a book out there called When the Sun Sets that Alan has written about Jared. There's just a lot out there and I dug through as much as I possibly could. Um, this is one that I definitely suggest you guys go and do your own research on. It is a lot. It's a whole lot. And unfortunately, this poor young boy is caught up in the middle of it. And I mean, they don't even have the rest of his remains. And it's like, who's to say in that area if they will ever be found or if the truth will ever come out? And I send my thoughts straight to Jared's family. They have literally been through hell and back. <laughs> no exaggeration. It exhausts me mentally to just talk about the story. I could never imagine actually living it as my real life. They have been through a lot and it's traumatizing and terrifying and my heart deeply goes out to them. Make sure you guys say something kind in the comments down below. But that's it for me today. I don't even know what to theorize. I don't even know what to say. I am just stuck and confused and disappointed. But I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Jared's story. This is one that's probably going to haunt me for the rest of my life. I would love to hear your opinions. I would love to hear your knowledge if you're from the area, if you've been on the Big South Trail, if you know anything about mountain lions. Also, try to keep it respectful and kind in the comments down below. But I'm gonna go ahead and go you guys happy new year it's a whole other new year of my channel i've already said it once before but i cannot wait to see what happens this year for this channel i've got a lot of plans i hope a lot of cases that i've covered we finally see resolution to i'm just excited and i love knowing that i'm starting a new year with a bunch of people who have the same passion as I do, who have the same interests as I do to help others and be a voice for others. I'm just really lucky and I'm thankful to have spent about a year and a half with you guys already and I can't wait to welcome another year in with you guys. But thank you so much for watching. I'm going to stop rambling now. Definitely don't forget to hit the like button and hit the subscribe button down below if you haven't already so you can become a part of the Helen fam and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys. Thank you.